So uh, it's good to see everyone. I guess we'll go ahead and, um, and get, get started. Uh, my name is David Gillette. I teach in the Department of Environmental Studies here. And uh, I had the privilege uh, to be able to spend a year uh, in Nepal on a Fulbright uh, Research Fellowship. And so uh, I've really been thinking about how I want to connect that with, uh, with all the friends here at UNCA. And so I see this as kind of a first step. This is going to be part data talk and probably larger part travelogue, which I think people will appreciate. Um, and so this, uh, I don't know what the format normally is. Thank uh, you so much for the invitation to come here. But I, I just like to do kind of an open conversational thing. So if you all have questions at any time, just, just uh, jump right in, OK? So uh, I have connections that go back to Nepal uh, a while. So this one I wanted to talk about today. I've got lots of slides. I don't know if I'll get through all of them. Um, if you're getting bored, I'll move on more quickly. But I, I want to talk about some backstory. And then, you know, so the scientific parts would be talking about uh, this study and um, some, some results. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you right now, I'm still analyzing data, but I do have some, some results um, on water temperature and fish diversity. Um, and then uh, your photos kind of sprinkled throughout here of this. Dave knows the wonderful place that is Nepal all through here. So, so um, when I graduated college, I went uh, to the Peace Corps in Nepal. And this is really my way of thinking of that I wanted to do something to benefit humanity. On the other hand, I just really loved fish. And so what do you do? Well, uh, I was fortunate to have the opportunity to join the Peace Corps and work in fish farming. Um, and so these are some pictures of me with uh, my host families. This is in the mid-90s. Um, and amazing culture over there. And so just this privilege to be able to really immerse with people that um, are coming from a very different place, literally and figuratively, than, than yourself. Um, the capital city of Kathmandu was sort of this crazy, uh, loud, just cacophony of things going on all the time. The word Kathmandu actually means wooden temple, city of wooden temples. And so almost on every street corner, you have these incredible temples. Um, and sadly, some of those uh, fell down in the earthquake, which happened um, in June of the year that, that I went. Um, but mostly what I did over there was fishes extension. So I worked in ponds like this, helping farmers determine how many fish to stock, what species, and that kind of thing. And some of the work that I enjoyed the most was working with, for instance, women's development groups where uh, we would uh, stock fishes, and it became sort of an income generation project to work uh, towards socioeconomic development. And so that was really rewarding. One of the things I did was fish breeding. So I, this is a, a midnight trip to this place in the, the southern border. He's grinding up uh, this uh, boy there was uh, the son of this fish farming family. And he was grinding up um, carp pituitary glands with, um, with ethanol in this mortar and pestle. And so we woke up the next morning and injected fish with this mix. And I thought it was never going to work. And lo and behold, it, it actually worked. And we had fish breeding here. And, these are not fish, these are people. But these are the, um, the, the fish that we took out to breed. And um, so some successes, but like everything, um, it wasn't all, all perfect. But just the amazing cultural interactions were, um, were very humbling. And then I did a lot of work. I have to have an obligatory big fish picture. This is me with uh, a snakehead. You may know that fish by its name, or maybe you saw the movie. And this is, this is me netting um, fish from a pond in Nepal at this time. And so we were doing research here to try and figure out kind of what is, is the best way to raise fish. And then we try and teach that to the farmers. But really what I did a lot of at the Fishes Development Center was this. Um, um, a lot of sitting around thinking as well and reading newspapers and things. And um, very, very hot at the time. So when I left the place, um, I had some really close friendships and just a wonderful experience. But little did I know there was another guy named Dave from the US, another guy named Dave from the in the US. A third Dave. Uh, a third Dave. <laughs> who uh, had been studying fishes there since the 1980s. And I met him just before I left Nepal. And in fact, ended up doing my master's with him at Emporia State University, after which I did my PhD at Oklahoma, uh, and then taught for a year in Texas uh, before coming here. But so all along, he and I were thinking, wouldn't it be great to get back to Nepal somehow? And so eventually we did. And so here are a couple contemporary pictures. This is a picture of the house where I lived for three years in Nepal. So we went back there you know, 20 years later. This is my wife and our children, Ashi and Stephen. Um, this is where we lived when we were first married for several months. Uh, so I had the chance to get back. This is me with, with my host family. Um, they had a fruit stand in the bazaar there, me visiting them. This is uh, Ramchandra, who is my dai. That means my older brother in the family. 
And then what was really cool was, you know, they, the, my brothers in that family now had kids, as did I. And so it was my daughter, Asia, with um, the daughters of two of my brothers from that family. And so it was this really neat kind of, um, you know, coming together of different generations from different places. And um, just such a privilege to be able to be involved in all the, the sharing that, that happened with this. We also went back to visit the place uh, where my wife and I met. This is the Baha'i House of Worship in New Delhi, India. And so that was a real exciting time for us and for the kids to see it as well. So what got us back to Nepal? Well, it's, it was the idea of connecting uh, biodiversity to ecosystem function in this part of the world where it's not well studied. So those of you that have my intro class, I apologize in advance. There'll be some review here. But um, so biodiversity is something that we need to have a sustainable human society. Whether you come at it from an ecosystem function perspective, an economic perspective, or just the idea that we want to support the cultures that we've um, evolved with over eons, we need to have biodiversity uh, in our lives. <clears throat> well, in, uh, in rivers and streams, it's a little bit of a special case, right? So fresh water, a little less than 1% of the Earth's surface, but about 6% of all species are there. So these are very uh, rich biodiversity-related uh, places. Uh, and not only that, we're losing species in these areas faster than what's on land as well. One of my favorite quotes from Aldo Leopold, to keep every cog and wheel is the first hallmark of intelligent tinkering, right? Meaning that if we want these ecosystems to keep working the way they always have, we should really ensure that all the pieces of them remain intact. And so that when we start to see species loss, our next thought should be, what does this mean to us as a people um, and our reliance on those ecosystems? Uh, and so I would argue we haven't been tinkering much more dramatically than with what we've been doing with, with greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And so, um, you know, we're up over 400 parts per million in the atmosphere now. Um, and so the relationship between this and climate and ultimately us is something that's starting to be studied pretty uh, intensively. And, you know, uh, we've seen species responding to climate change. One of the things we've seen is species moving their ranges toward the poles to escape warmer temperatures. This is a study um, done looking at butterflies in the British Isles. The other thing that happens is that we can have changes in phenology, the timing of uh, events in plant and animal life cycles. Um, and so, for instance, we found that certain species of plants are flowering earlier, certain migratory birds are arriving earlier. These sorts of things are happening, right? So, so as an ecologist, I don't think about is climate change happening. I think about what does climate change mean to the ecosystems that I study, right? Because it is definitely um, playing a role as we speak. So what about Nepal? Well, there's been a significant loss of uh, glaciers recently in the Himalayas. And in the mountain regions of Nepal, the, the climate has been warming on a rate that's between three and five times that of the rest of the planet. So this is an area that is, is warming fairly rapidly. So a, an important place uh, to try and get a handle on what climate change means to ecosystems. Nepal is sometimes called the third pole because it does, in fact, store the most snow and ice uh, outside of the poles on the planet. And uh, it's important because there are about 1.4 billion people that rely on the water that flows on the, out of the Himalayas directly. But then there's about 3 billion people that rely, that rely on these water bodies for either food that's grown from the water coming out of them or energy that's produced from hydroelectricity generated from them. So um, in massive impacts on lots of folks in this very densely populated uh, part of the world. And again, please jump on in at any time if you have questions here. So um, the Kaligandaki River um, was, was where I, I studied. And it's really a unique opportunity for a couple reasons. First of all, my major advisor, Dr. David Eds, has been working there since the 1980s. He was uh, twice there as a Fulbright scholar himself. Uh, and so we got to build on his work. And what's really interesting is that uh, Amr Gurung, who was right here, uh, worked with Dr. Eds in the 80s, with him in the 90s, and then with me last year. So it's pretty awesome. So this is a Kali, and so uh, Dr. Ed surveyed 40 sites all along the length of this river. I'll show you what the headwaters and the tailwaters look like, but suffice to say, um, this chunk of central Nepal uh, is sort of bisected by this river system that flows north to south, uh, and so he worked all along that. So a chance to follow up on that. So this river is amazing because it was, you kind of like the French Broad River here was flowing before the Appalachians began to rise up. Similarly, the Kali Gandaki River was flowing before the Himalayas started to rise. And as the Himalayas rose, it just kept cutting right through them. 
So instead of flowing out of the Himalayas, Kali Gandaki actually arises on the Tibetan Plateau and flows through the Himalayas. And so you can see on this elevational map uh, in the, the shaded area, the, the rectangle here, the valley that starts up on the Tibetan Plateau in uh, Mustang and just cuts through there all the way down. So Nepal is an amazing place because on the order of a couple hundred miles, you go from 300 meters of elevation down to about 100, or, I'm sorry, 3,000 meters of elevation down to about 100. So it's crazy. It's like living on a staircase, sort of. Um, so what does it look like at the higher elevations? These are the, the trans-Himalayan areas. We're up over 2,000 meters uh, sea, above sea level here. And this is actually a desert. Uh, it's a high elevation desert. You're in the rain shadow of the Himalayas. So there's not much vegetation. You have this kind of scrubby stuff going on along the hills here. And almost all the water you get here is glacier, glacier melt that happens during the day and then you get less flow at night. It's a really interesting system. And these are the fish that you find there, um, called the snow trout, but it's uh, actually a minnow. Uh, Asala is the common name for it. Uh, and it feeds on the bottom on algae and things like that. This is what fish look like here. Uh, when you go to this area, we look like this because it's just really <laughs> cold. You can see back, back there. All right, so let's move down a little bit. When you get into the mid hills, then these rivers start looking kind of like um, like the French Broad or the Davidson or the Mills, a little, like a big Mills River. Um, and so you start to get uh, some different kinds of habitat here. You've got more greenery because we're coming out of that rain shadow. And um, I just have to say, you know, the landscape over there, like humbling is the best word that I can use. Like you just go there and it's like, wow. Like you just kind of want to stand around and stare. Um, and so, um, as I was standing around and staring, I thought about these rivers and what I was going to do in them. So in these mid-hills, you get some different kinds of fishes. Uh, you get some, these are called loaches. Some of you might have uh, seen these in the aquarium trade. They've got barbels here. They're feeding on the bottom. They're, um, they're feeding on insects and detritus in the bottom of the stream. This is a fish called, um, it was actually on a uh, episode of uh, River Monsters. Um, it doesn't get that big. It is not a man-eater, actually. It's not a man-eater. <laughs> but it is an important predator in these systems. And uh, um, these are smaller ones. So you start getting fish like this. Then as we move even down further, we're in the lowlands. OK, so we're in this place. We're about uh, probably three, four miles from the Indian border. We've come out of the Himalayas. We're into a, um, a river that looks kind of like the Satilla, if any of you know that river in, in Georgia, a real sandy bottom, sort of slow-moving river over here. And what do we find down here? Well, we find uh, fish that look a lot like, um, like shiners that we get here. A couple of folks here know what I mean when I, when I say shiners. Um, so minnow species, these are, these are called Borrelius. These are glass fish, um, funky looking things. Got some yellow pigment, but pretty transparent. Uh, this kind of fish is everywhere. It's a species of barb. Um, and again, a lot of aquarium fishes involved in this. This is a fish, an example of one of a lot of fish where people are still trying to figure out what species they are. Um, I felt bad because somebody actually asked me for some samples of this fish and I wasn't able to, to get them. But this is a, a group of fish that we don't even have in, in North America. It's, well, it's a variation on the, on the cichlids. And then where you've got deeper waters, you've got big fish because big fish eat smaller fish. And so you've got different species of catfish and things that are hanging out in the deep waters. And a pretty large indigenous fishermen community who are there um, kind of taking advantage of this resource. And when, so you hang, when you hang out in this part of the river, you can take off your hat, take or just wade right on in. And so this is myself and my colleague, uh, Dr. Bibuti Ranjan Jha from Kathmandu University. The reason he's wearing all Virginia Tech gear here is because he was actually a Fulbright Scholar at Virginia Tech um, several years ago. So we had this cool kind of Fulbright Scholar exchange thing going on. Um, so we're further down. All right, so what do we do? Well, we went in, we sampled our fish populations, and we really wanted to get a handle on how climate change might be in fact impacting this. So we installed water temperature data loggers, and um, this is the master plan here. Uh, we're using some remote sense data to basically determine how land surface temperature influences water temperature. Uh, and then once we've got that figured out, we can recreate some water temperature regimes in this river basin and see whether um, temperature at a certain elevation has changed at all in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and so there's another gentleman that's doing this work, and I actually owe him a lot of time because he has a whole 
spreadsheet for me to go through when I have time. But I love teaching so much, I, I'm doing other things. So, um, so then what we're going to do once we, once we test for changes in uh, the temperature is we're going to see if the fish care. The fish distributions have changed at all as a response to that. Um, and then the other thing is just to look at, at species loss and if that's occurred. So everything grayed out, I'm not going to talk about today. <laughs> but we will talk about species loss and uh, some of the methods. It's going to be a lot of fun. So um, this is uh, Dr. Eds. So long story short, um, I was able to come over on um, the Fulbright research grant, but we also had funding from World Wildlife Fund and um, uh, National Geographic Committee for Research and Exploration. And so David was able to come out on there. I swear everybody working over there was named David, including David Penrose. Um, and so he was able to, to show me literally how he sampled these sites in the 80s and 90s. So we like totally recreated it. I mean, it's like you don't always get that opportunity. So this is us down on, on one of the lower rivers. And then um, I thought it was so important to get local scientists into this activity, right? Because, I mean, that's how you make things sustainable, right? Folks that are living there uh, have, to, have to take an interest or not and become invested. And so being out there with Dr. Zha was just fabulous and really exciting. So we went back to these sites and we sampled them in the exact same way. This is me in the water. This is Dr. Ed. You can see his head still, I think, there in, the, in the water. We sampled them using nets and whatnot. And then we brought all of our fishes back to the lab. And you know, for every day you spend in the field, it's like a week in the lab trying to figure out what species these are. Because there's no like Fishes of Nepal book that you can look up and key <laughs> things out. There's about five books. And as Dr. Ed would say, we use triangulation. So this book said, well, maybe it's this. But then this book thought, well, maybe it's this. And so, oh, I'm, I've, we're still thinking about this. But anybody recognize this fish here? You get the imaginary gold star, Henry. That is a common carp, which was actually invasive that we found in the river there, which hadn't been there before. Yeah. All right. Then we went and we installed these water temperature data loggers at 40 sites. This is Elmer Groom. You know the, 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 the young man that I showed like carrying the bag in the earlier picture? This is Elmer now. And so my kids actually made like 40 of these modules, these PVC things that you can screw in and out. And so we put temperature data loggers into those and then used rebar to cable these things into the substrate. So we went out in December and did that. Uh, so we pound these things in using this thing that looks like a plunger, but it's almost like it's like a Nepali sledgehammer. It's like a, almost like a post hole or post driver kind of thing. And uh, then we, we connected these things in using, using cable. Now, one of the things I realized was there was a scrap metal thing just down the road from where we lived in Kathmandu. So I we just bought a bunch of these rods, and then you could go, and for like two bucks, this guy would bend them into whatever shape we wanted and sharpen them and all this amazing stuff. Uh, so here's a picture of me with that. We're down in the plains. I'm trying not to burn myself on it. I'm like, oh, it's really, really hot, really hot. Uh, here's Umar Guru in here. And so we visited all these sites. And this is a site in uh, the National Park that we had to get a permit to go to. And the reason we have army people with us was because they thought we were going to be attacked by a tiger or something, which um, fortunately we weren't, maybe because they were there. I don't know. Um, but this, this site was a little bit intimidating to me because when we went at this time, there were all these crocodiles around. And I'm thinking in my head, I'm going to be neck deep saning in this river later on. So I went in the summer, and the good news was, so I didn't see any of these crocodiles. We finished the sampling and all this stuff, and I'm like, that was great. Where are all the crocodiles? What do you think they said? They're all on the river. You just didn't see them because the water's warm enough that they, they don't have to come out to bask in the sun. And I'm like, I'm really glad you told me that after I did all the sampling. <laughs> Although, to be perfectly honest, I don't know that there are any records of these crocodiles attacking people. But I didn't want to be the first because if nobody's around and they eat somebody, like, how do you, how do you get a record of that? I, I don't know. I don't know. So we went to our sites and we're putting this rebar in, um, pounding that in. Uh, and then we put a bunch of air temperature data loggers into because they wanted to know how well the water temperature tracked the air temperature. Um, and then this is when we finished it up. And we were pumped. At least I was pumped. Um, <laughs> yes, we got this done. And so this is a picture when we finished all of that, all of that work. Anybody in, in, uh, in stream, Joseph, I don't know if you noticed this. It's the same, the same stuff, we, same pair of those we use for stream ecology to make our little modules. OK, and then we went back, and we had to retrieve all these data loggers. And whenever we retrieved these, it was a happy occasion. Um, this is a site where we had to build a dam and dig this thing out where it had gotten three feet uh, submerged. 
So this is seven months later. And these are some Kathmandu University thesis students that um, used invertebrate data, actually. They just followed along with us and took invertebrate samples of their fish samples and did an undergraduate thesis from it. And this is where we got one in a river down in, in southern Nepal. So that's why we're swimming around in the place here. But it wasn't all happy. This is us hunting for one uh, down near the Indian border and not finding it. This is me on my laptop trying to look at the pictures because we took pictures where we installed all these. And um, bottom line is uh, several of them got removed. We went to one site and, and you know, we talked to the people after we put them in so they would leave them in hopefully. And then we came back to get it and we said, where's that little that machine that measures temperature? They said, oh, somebody, somebody thought that that was a bomb on the pier and so we took it out. I'm just going, oh man. <laughs> so we didn't get all these back, but we, we tried real hard. So this was us starting to head up the mountain for our first run of field work. And it was really sweet because uh, Amr Dai here is wearing this hat, which uh, David Eds had given him. So he kind of wore this the whole time we were sampling. And it was almost like our kind of like tribute to David Eds that he was with us, even though we were out there sampling. And so um, this is my brother-in-law, um, his wife, my nephew. Um, and so it was kind of a family affair uh, going up here. Uh, also want to mention other Kathmandu University collaborators. Two more students that collected invertebrate data and got a thesis out of the project. It was pretty cool. This is our gang sampling in the warmer <coughs> months with, uh, with the DNET, which they have in Nepal as well, um, and some sampling gear here. There's Dr. Ja. Again, here's Amar Dai. He was always busy. He was just always doing something. He's one of those guys who I need to have with me because he's always doing something productive. Like even when you want to get him to pose for a photo, he's like, no, I've got to, I've got to fix this saying right here. <laughs> like, All right, Amar Dai, you're doing great. All right, so let's look at some temperature results. Well, um, we would get the, the data back and often see something like this. We've got our little temperature plots and then this sudden spike. Anybody, anybody have any idea why something measuring water temperature would suddenly show this extreme variation? Any thoughts? We got the scale on the X-axis, like over what period <coughs> those spikes occur? My department chair is asking me to present this the way that it should be presented. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so this is just a time scale over, that's a great, great question, I mean, um, over four months, a little over four months, and this is degrees C from 15 to 20. So these are the daily spikes, and, and I'll give this away, in the water, but sometimes these things would get taken out and okay they're in the air right here for sure and we knew they're on the cable this is a this is actually a place where the water got so low that they came out so uh so i had to wade through that all right this is the most confusing graph not only that i'm going to show you but that you may see this year perhaps um we've got our time horizon from january through june and degrees centigrade and these are daily averages at all of our sites and really all i want you to get out of this graph is that we collected a lot of data and that, uh, this is, so this was a range from about 180 meters above sea level to 3,000. And what was interesting to me, because we had these things instantaneously recording temperature all over the place, is that at any given moment, you had a variation between 12 and 14 degrees centigrade from 3,000 meters down to 180 meters. So that just tells you sort of the, the range of thermal habitats that these fish have available to them. That's the range that they can, they, they can cover when they move up and down these rivers. Um, and there's some interesting things going on here, but um, these sites here are all in the lower area, those rivers that have come out of the Himalayas. These here are all up in the Tibetan Plateau. Um, and so these are what we're using to model temperatures at each site as a function of land surface temperature, and then relate that back to the fish. Uh, but one interesting thing that came out um, was how much temperature fluctuated at those high elevation sites. Um, so Here's a site at about 200 meters above sea level. And yeah, it is warmer than these sites at 1,000 and 3,000 meters. But there's not much diurnal variation. But this site way up on the Tibetan Plateau is crazy. The, the maximum temperature in some days at 3,000 meters in the water is higher than what you had at 1,000 meters. If you see those blue lines just reaching up above those black lines. Incredible temperature variation. And so the fish that live there, you know, how are they dealing with it? The bugs that live there, you know, how are they dealing with that? It's a really good question. And you know, I think what's happening is you've just got this wide open river that doesn't have anything shading it. It doesn't have any feeder stream. It just cooks out there in the sun all day, goes on up. And then that glacial meltwater again at night 
you know, the first re temperature recordings we took here were, were one degree Celsius, right? So uh, one thing that came out of this is just how temporally variable the temperature is here. It's crazy. All right, so if I were to ask you guys that you have to pick the, the sections of this river that might be a refuge to climate change for fish, how might you, th how might you think about that question? Any thoughts? You wouldn't think about the question, but 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 I would. Well, um, so here's how I any. No, I'm, you, I think we need to go back and talk. Yeah, I think <laughs> we need to yes. plan another research proposal and go back. I mean, that's because that's such a good question. So this is Dr. Dr. Dave Penrose, who I found out like a month before I went to Nepal that he was going to Nepal. And he said, hey, I know you've been to Nepal. I'm going to Nepal next fall as a Fulbright Scholar. I'm like, really? I'm going to Nepal next fall as well. And so we had, and we'd collaborated before that. And so we met over there. Yeah. I'll show something that relates to Dave. And then he actually taught uh, an aquatic ecology related course when I was over there. So it's this like cool synergy. We both live in West Asheville. And we both yeah. live in West Asheville. <laughs> yeah. What is, what's <laughs> They thought the folks at KU, we were in the same department at Kathmandu University, so they all thought that everyone in the U.S. that works on aquatic ecosystems is named Dave and comes from West Africa. <laughs> I suppose there are worse assumptions that could be made about Dave. I suppose find out the uh, temperature requirements that each fish species needs, like what it can tolerate to like the greatest extent or the least extent. That is data that would be really, really valuable, but we unfortunately don't have. We, we need that, but we don't have it. So we had to take sort of a broader view. Um, and so really sort of, sort of looked at it two ways. We, we said, all right, there may be sections of this river that don't warm as fast as air temperature. It could be groundwater influx, stuff like that. Um, or there could be sections where cooler water tributaries under the river. So we looked at, at four sites that spanned a, a pretty wide elevational gradient. Um, and we looked, so some Google Earth images. And so we, we basically looked where rivers came in, and we measured water temperature right where the river came in, and then upstream from it to see what was going on. Um, this is one of those sites. And I'll just point out, when we put these temperature data loggers in, I feel like I should tell stories today more than anything else. Like, if you don't see all, yeah, yeah. there's nobody shaking their head, but a few people nodding. Um, <laughs> When we put these temperature data loggers in, it was in winter, and everybody said um, the water level is probably going to go down by the time you take them out in June. So you're like, you got to put them in kind of deep because you don't want them to be high and dry. So we went operating on that assumption. So here's, we've got lots of these pictures of Umradai pointing to where the data logger is with me <laughs> taking pictures. Um, so this is Umradai. So right down in here is where we put the temperature thing. Um, but it was, it was a relatively deep section. All right, well, here's what it looked like when we came back to get it. Remember this rock, like this. Um, and so, so we knew where that thing was, but it took myself um, and um, um, Raju, our driver, like a long time to actually get out there. And I, I went out there too. It, was, it wasn't just like I said, hey, go get that data log and come back. I was actually out there with him looking for it. Um, and we, the only way we were able to get it was like, I reached my toe down and like found the cable and like was able to kind of, Lift it up. So we got our data here, um, and uh, you know it was because if you get washed downstream there, it's just not going to be fun at that particular point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so long story short, um, we looked at the temperature in Modi Kola, which Kola means stream in Nepali, and in the Kali Gandaki, and it was pretty much a match. So really, no difference going on there. And then we came to this place called Misti Kola. This place is crazy as well because we were upstream catching, trying to catch fish, and this local guy comes along and he says. I'll give you a thousand rupees if you guys catch one fish out of this stream. Oh. So of course, knowing us, we tried to catch fish out of that stream, <laughs> but we didn't. And looking at the guy, I don't know if he had a thousand rupees, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So later on, we're like, you know, we didn't catch any. What gives? Well, it turned out there had been a landslide upstream, and they said the water was literally like yogurt. It was so thick with all the fine particles. And he said literally fish were like jumping onto the banks and like, going downstream to try to get out of the way. And so this was an interesting lesson to us about just how geologically dynamic these watersheds are um, and what that means for a, a fish, you know? I mean, that's pretty crazy if you gotta be able to get out of a river that fast. Um, so, but anyway, but, but we still measured the temperature there, uh, although we did not catch any fish. And 
um, we found a pretty good match. <laughs> our data logger got buried arm deep, I think by all that sediment from the avalanche, not avalanche, landslide. I'm sure there's a better geological term for that. Am I saying that right, Jeff? Okay. <laughs> Um, so, not much going on there. So here was, was Reedy Cola, a stream that brings in a lot of clay. You can see the mixing here um, into the river. Uh, and now here, what was interesting was the, the water temperature at Reedy Cola in the blue was actually slightly warmer than that of the Kali Gandaki in the black, consistently from January through June. So instead of this being a potential refuge as the temperature warms, this might be a place that like, you're going to have to avoid more because this is actually warmer. So that was, that was not good. The final place we looked at is the, the Trisuli River. And this is a river that, uh, according to Hindu mythology, um, one of the gods planted their uh, Trisul, this sort of three-pointed staff, and the river supposedly arose from that. And so it flows down and meets the Kali Gandaki right here. This is the site a little ways upstream from there. This landscape is almost like, I don't know, Tolkien-esque? No, um, New Zealand-esque, because that, of course, is really what um, Lord of the Rings was about. Just really beautiful. Um, and this was, this was a one-day drive and then a five-hour hike to get to this site. Uh, but what was interesting was that when you go downstream, this is, this is the, the, the Trisuli River. So we came over here in a raft and now we're looking for a place to put our data logger. When you looked at the temperature, though, the Trisuli consistently brought cool water into this river. And so this was a place where we really said, all right, if you're managing in the face of climate change and fish need a cool place, you know, watch the confluence of the Trisuli and the Kali. All right. You said I haven't shown nearly as many pictures. You're right, I haven't shown enough pictures yet. All right, so I want to show you some fish data here. So comparing, comparing decades, now, one of the things was the way that we got around. There used to be no road going up to these high elevation sites. You had to walk everywhere. Well, now there were roads, but they were constantly in states of rebuilding due to the landslides. I mean, constant. It was, it was normal to be waiting for um, machinery to clear off this road so we could go. And so this is um, one of the KU students just waiting for us to get ready to go here. So sometimes we thought maybe it should have been better to walk. So here's some data. We've got the, the, the early 80s here. This might be a better way to do it. About 60 collections, about 20,000 individuals. Now, I want you to look mainly at the number of species here. So in the, in the, in the 80s, about almost 80 species with 60 collections. Now in the 90s, fewer collections, but fewer species. In the 2015-16 time period, more collections in the 90s slightly fewer species. But does anything j jump out at you, just looking at those numbers? What do you think jumped out at me? Yeah, a whole bunch of fewer individuals. Yeah, a whole bunch fewer individuals. Lots fewer individuals. What's interesting is that the species numbers are not crazy different. I mean, they're a little bit, but so many fewer fish in the, in the stream, which is really interesting. Um, now, David and I are still going back and forth on how our final analysis is going to go on this, but what we did... Those are individual fish. Individual fish. Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't want to interrupt you. No, go ahead. When you finish. Oh, okay, what's a collection? Oh, so a collection is one time that you go to that stream and sample it. So... Is it an equal number of hours in each collection? So they vary by site, but they were consistent. So, like, we sampled... Um, the same 40 sites in the 90s and 2000s, and we had more in the 80s. So that was one of the things we had to think about. Do we want to throw out the samples from the 80s that we didn't sample later on? Um, and I think at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to go back and just look at the 40 that were sampled in the same season um, at all times. But because we had more data here, we wanted to use them somehow. Um, so that's an excellent point. And so, <clears throat> so the idea is, if you sample one section of a stream, if, if you sample in one time period more than others, you obviously can't compare numbers directly, right? Because the, the sampling effort varies. So there are these things you can use called species accumulation curves. And basically what that means is, if we were to sample in all of these times, 60, make 60 collections in all these time periods, it'll statistically estimate for us what our numbers would look like. Does that make sense? <coughs> 
so here's what happens when we do that. It's really interesting. So um, there's a number of samples that are taken. And it turns out you can go up to a number about three times your actual samples. So about 120 is what we told it to, to sample. And what this computer program does is it goes into your data and it starts taking random samples. And so you can say, hey, take 120 samples, take 60 samples, take 50. And then this is the number of species on the y-axis. And so, as you might expect, initially, you pick up new species really rapidly. But then later on, when you've already collected the majority of species, you don't add new species very rapidly. And what this statistical analysis actually suggests is that if we were to apply the same sampling effort across all three time periods, these solid bars are the actual estimates, and these dotted lines are what we call the 95% confidence interval, the number, the range within which we're 95% confident statistically that our, our value lies within. Then there's almost no, no difference. Now, David, <laughs> we're shaking our heads over this, and one of the things we're going to do next is we're going to do the analysis just with the 40 that we sampled in all of them, and probably do like a repeated measures ANOVA. But we wanted to use all the data that we had to throw into this. So this suggests that there was not a big difference right, because of this effect, right? That we're on the same curve, but depending on where we are on our x-axis gives us different values on the y-axis. So uh, I'm putting this preliminary italicized, bolded, and underlined, um, <laughs> is that it appears that there's not a whole lot of, of I'm sorry, change. There may be chance. Chance may be involved. Maybe a game of chance in overall species diversity. But this trend of decreasing abundance is pretty worrisome. Because if that continues, statistically speaking, you're going to start, the risk of a species going extinct be, increases when its population goes down and down and down. That's the other kind of bizarre thing, is that there were 22 species collected in the 80s and 90s, but not in 2015 and 16. And yet our statistical model still told us that there's not a huge difference there. So we are going to take another tack uh, with these. And right now, we're, we're kind of going through the spreadsheets to do that. What do you guys think? Trust those? Do you, do you trust those conclusions? I'm kind of like, <laughs> if I give this talk in a year, this slide may or may not look slightly different when you do our different analysis. Yeah. So when the when there was this landslide, yeah, right? How does that relate to the species diversity? Did that skew the data at all? It's so only one river. It's only one day. Well, so you know what's funny about that site, or perhaps not hilarious, um, is that there weren't when there were no fish collected there in the 80s or 90s either. Oh. So from a comparison perspective, that probably didn't have a real impact. Now, that may have affected stuff further downstream, where we caught fish, but maybe less than we would have otherwise. I don't know. That's a good question. David. Yeah, the, David. The, um, the, the species that were missing in the most recent collections, Yeah. was there any, um, are there any commonalities between the species that you could say, this species was not collected because of its feeding or its thermal preference. Any kind of conclusions along that line? So what they were mostly were species that existed more in the lowlands um, and stuff that, that was rare. So, so stuff, so like, um, like, um, like some, some gouramis, which are an aquarium fish, uh, some puffer fish even, which we didn't get, which are down there. Stuff that, um, you know, didn't occur in the mountains. So lower down in the, in the watershed, you usually got more species. But those places where you were supposed to get a lot, we got less. The sites up in the watershed where there were fewer species, we still got what had been gotten before for the most part. Um, but yeah, ecologically, um, a lot of them were kind of pool fish, um, you know, slow flowing, deep habitat kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, I know, I know that um, the west slope of the Himalayas needs a lot of research, a lot yeah. more information. Yeah. But could you look at the fish you collected and um, prioritize them according to tolerance values? I mean, are there fish that, that are particularly sensitive that you would worry about? That all needs to get done. I mean, so IUCN, you know, International Union for Conservation of Nature, basically just goes by expert opinion, where like they'll ask, like TK Shrestha, University of Pokhara, what fish do you think we should have this category of most concern? And he'll say something, even though he's been out there, but there's no systematic data. There's a huge need, really, for that. And that's one thing we're hoping to do, is to just look at our data and say, what species have become less common, which ones did not? Because we've got data for three different time periods. So 
we, we can look at rates of decline among two times. So if you collect it two times, you can say what's increasing or decreasing, right? But if you collect three times, you can say how that rate of increase or decrease has changed potentially, right? Because you've got three. So we need to do that. So maybe next year if I could take another sabbatical. Um, <laughs> There's always stuff to do, right? I got your back, man. You got my back? Yeah. <laughs> that worked out pretty well last time, didn't it? I can't complain about that. Man, it was like it was cosmic or something, Dave. We're both was, named yeah. Dave, both, both fabulously good looking, both in West I know. <laughs> <laughs> what was um, that? I, I, I don't want to monopolize the No, question. no. What, what, the students that went with you collected the insects. Yeah. What did they do? I mean, what did they... Was it a PhD program that they were working on? They were, well, um, one of them was master's, and the other two were undergraduate. Yeah. Did they have previous information, like from the 80s, that they looked at as well? Or? Um, there was just a little bit on uh, dragonfly larva that David had published, but everything else, it was new. Oh, cool. Yeah. But guys like Deep, who I think maybe you know Deep yeah, and yeah, his wife, Deep, well, yeah. they, uh, they went back to do some more work with WWF for that. So he, okay. yeah. All right, how am I doing on time here? Okay, I think I'm about a quarter of the way done. We're doing well. Um, <laughs> so that was what I kind of wrote my proposal to come to do. But then it was amazing when I got over there, all this cool work that was being done that they needed like, help from an aquatic ecologist. It's like, is there an aquatic ecologist in the room? And I'm like, yeah, right here. Um, so this was something that the World Wildlife Fund was working on. It's called e-flows. The idea is that if you're managing a river, one of the biggest things you need to manage is how much water is in the river. And it's all based on who needs what, right? So if I'm, if I'm a manager, I need to know how much water the farmers need. I need to know how much water the municipality needs. I need to know how much water um, the Hindu community needs for their religious traditions. All of these things. Um, and so e-flow is this big buzzword, which I'm still trying to wrap my head around. But it basically means you get user groups together in a meeting like this and say, how much water do you need in this river in what month? All right, well, if we build a dam, we've got to make darn sure we got that much water in the river at that time. Um, so they wanted us to do a bunch of stuff, and we did some of it. Um, I swear they're things. Um, and so one thing we looked at were species that need a lot of high flow velocity. Um, so the question is from a fish perspective as well, when do we need how much water? And so these are some different species of catfishes, four different species, if you can believe that. A lot of them have these crazy suckers on the ventral surface to attach to the rocks. So we looked at species like that. Uh, this is a crazy catfish with this whip tail on it. The locals actually call it, a, call it they, they say it's a, a kira, which means like a bug. And they don't, they don't eat it. Like they're like, this, it's like a, I don't know, what kind of insect does that look like? Something not fish-like. Looks like, almost like a rat fish or something. So, this is out there. These crazy catfish where their whole ventral surface is a sucker. And so these are like stuck onto the side of your bucket, the side of rocks, these crazy things. Here's a picture of one from the side. They're really pretty cool looking. Um, you know, so anyway, so we've got a lot of numbers on these. And so we were able to go through and tell them these species hang out in these particular sites. So these are sites that you, you're going to need to maintain flow at. Whereas other sites, um, flow might not be as important, to, uh, you know compromise there. Um, and so what do those sites look like? I mean, they're areas with, 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 with pretty high flow. I'm going to move a little more rapidly here. Um, one place that was really important in this watershed, the border to India is right here. So we're in southern Nepal. And the river flows down here. And I don't know if you can see, but there's a lot of water here until it gets to this dam. And then below here, there's not much. But to either side, there are canals that take this water to farmers. Well, it turned out this dam was a really important place, that there were a lot of these fishes that needed flow both above and below it. So the importance of this area for conservation really jumped out pretty discreetly, like a fish jumping out of water. Um, and so here you can see again, all this water behind the dam, not much below it. And so these are sites that we sampled. Um, and these irrigation canals just taken more water out of the river than remains in the river. It was pretty crazy. Um, so when you go to this place, you know, in, in the dry season, this is what it looks like, and there's just no water. Um, and so that's kind of bad for fish. When you get up above high elevation, more, more snow trout here. Um, not a trout, but won't worry about that. Um, we looked at migratory fish and when they need water. And so again, these species were quite important economically. And they, they came out playing a pretty big role. Um, the site where we got the most species was in Royal Chitwan National Park. At this particular area, we got 21 species there. 
This is uh, an aerial view of it from Google Earth, and you can see the sort of braided channel with all these different kinds of habitats. You've got backwater habitats, riffle habitats, right? So another real important place for them to preserve. All right, so while this is all going on, we're actually living in Kathmandu as well. And um, we had electricity in our house sometimes, uh, but no central heating all the time. So when it was cold outside, it was cold inside. So you just wore your hat and everything else whenever you're working. So there's Asia and Subala um, working hard. But you know, we still, we didn't have a coffee maker, but we, we, I found this French press for like five bucks or something. And so I could still make coffee and that was fun. And Asia and I both have our matching UNCA sweats on here. I don't know if you can <laughs> see that. So that was, that was pretty cool. Um, this is where we actually lived. This is the second floor on this flat. In the neighborhood is where we uh, hung out. What did we do? Well, there's a place just down the street where everyone played soccer. So these are all the, the school kids in their school dress after school. Don't worry, it's after school. They'd all come and we, we bought a soccer ball. So it was cool, everybody came and played. And uh, this is a group, the older soccer group. And they play with kind of two bricks as a goal. And so there's Ashi and Steven. If you knock the bricks over, it was a goal. And if you wonder why people are wearing masks here, uh, it's because in some places the air was bad. And these masks <laughs> actually did nothing to keep out the stuff which caused it the most trouble, but people would still sort of wear them and think that it helped. And anyway, there's issues there. So that was happening. Amazing temples. This is called, um, a place called uh, uh, Bodhnilkant. Um, it is a place that the uh, kings of Nepal were not supposed to look upon ever. So you may know now there was um, sort of a tragedy where the crown prince um, killed much of the royal family and legend has it, it's because he somehow viewed this before that happened. Um, a lot of really interesting uh, religious beliefs in the area. This, I hope this isn't inappropriate. So this to me looks for all the word like Bert Holmes, to get the Bert, but so there are also holy men all over Nepal and there'd be pictures of them and I just, I just thought this was, amusing and took a picture because I thought it looked like Bert Holmes. <laughs> Sorry. So he may or may not be in Nepal serving as a holy man. I'll have to get to the bottom of that. Um, this is a time, if any of you guys saw the movie um, Doctor Strange, that was actually filmed in Nepal while we were there and it was like going to be extras. But this is where they filmed part of that place called uh, Bodhnilkant. It's um, a Buddhist temple and these eyes overlook the valley and it's been there for about a thousand years. They overlook the Kathmandu Valley. Um, but um, this is another temple that was being reconstructed due to the earthquake. I haven't put in a lot about the earthquake. I could just talk for five hours. We'd have to bring like a big cup of coffee or a pot of coffee or something. But so doing some repair work after the earthquake here. It's an amazing place. Um, this is a monkey and then looking out over the Kathmandu Valley, which is a bit hard to see with the light, but um, this is going to be better. Uh, or not that one. But I just. This, this air is really bad. I don't know how well you can see that. Like you can't even see across the valley anymore because the air is so bad. The monkey is kind of sad at that, potentially. <laughs> so air quality was a big issue. But we got out of the valley whenever we could. This was uh, when we went on, on a trek. Those of you all that are on our, on our Facebook page have seen this. So we went up, um, we did some trekking. This is the picture on uh, a place called Poon Hill looking across at um, the different Annapurnas and some stuff over there. Um, and then the last thing I want to share, if I have time, was another thing that I kind of happened into. And this is a project looking at uh, environmental DNA. So if you want to know what fish in, are in that river, uh, you could hire me and I'd hire a bunch of helpers and we'd all go there and we'd net like crazy to find out what species were in there. But what if you could take a water sample of that river, filter it, take out the DNA, sequence that, and just figure out what fish are in the river from that? Well, that's the idea behind this uh, environmental DNA project. And so um, there are reservoirs in river systems that have pretty dramatic effects on the fauna. This is a, a, a reservoir up in the Kaligandaki River. And downstream, you know, again, um, not much habitat for fish there. So this river called the Karnali is in the western Nepal with no dams on it at all. An amazing fish fauna. So U.S. Um, Agency for International Development wanted to know, they wanted background data to know what this does to the river. So this is a picture of a survey crew doing surveys to, to build a dam here, a hydroelectric dam. And I showed this picture to David Eds and he said, that picture really makes me sad <laughs> because it's going to flood massive amounts of habitat and for sure lead to some 
impacts on the fish. However, in the city of Kathmandu, before the monsoon, we had electricity 12 hours a day. It's called load shedding, because the amount of, energy, of electricity that was produced did not meet the demand. So it's a real hard sell to say, you know, you can't produce any more electricity because we want to keep the rivers intact, right? So what you really need to do is to be able to quantify, hey, what is this going to do to the rivers? On the other hand, right, how are we going to meet the needs for electricity? You know, it's not quite that simple. This, a lot of this electricity is going to be sold to India and things. But um, these are the big issues in development, right? So we went down to this place. This is um, Nikolai Storr, who works for the US Forest Service in the International Programs Department, which to me is the coolest job ever. I didn't know they had one. Um, uh, yeah, and then, um, so we went, we went um, and this, this is uh, Sagar, who's who's doing this, um, runs this program called Molecular Dynamics Nepal. They have really cool jackets, but they've done things like sequence the tiger genome and um, snow leopard genome. So they're doing like hardcore serious molecular genetics work. So uh, they made a fish collection and showed it to me and it was very nice. I, I'm enjoying it there as you can see. So we got down there to scout this place out. We got there right after Prince Harry. So um, they left the thing up. They didn't say anything about welcoming us, but Prince Harry had just been there. <laughs> so we're in the southern part, there's like elephants, cruising around and stuff. It's pretty sweet. We, this is our Jeep. We went out there. We, we hired Amar Dai to go out, so that was really cool. This is um, uh, Deep Shaha, who works for International Union for Conservation of Nature. Was a real good friend. But this driver, like he wasn't, he was good for driving around in Kathmandu, but not so much uh, outside of Kathmandu. So we went out, and the next thing you know, we get like a flat tire, which happens when you're driving on these awful roads. So we said, all right, we'll hang out here while you uh, change it and put the spare on. And you know what he said? What spare? That's when we realized we are going to be arriving a little bit later than we planned. So, so he like went off wheeling his tire down to find some place that could fix it and then wheeled it back and we sat around drinking tea or something. I don't know, because that was his job. Um, that was a tire. We were sad about that. We got to National, Bardia National Park. We worked with students from Kathmandu University again. So I, I bought some waiters and brought them over. But we soon found that the waiter sizes that I brought were maybe not perhaps ideal for the assistants <laughs> that were going to be working with us. So these were two students. This is part of their undergraduate research project. But yes, we did find eventually some waiters, which were remarkably like our waiters. So now they're happy, and they're all ready to go. All right, and they've got cool hats and stuff. And David, I can't see. What does it say on that hat? It says Hot Springs. Why would it say Hot Springs, North Carolina, on a hat being worn by but someone out in Nepal? I just don't understand. Somebody gave out a lot of Hot Springs, North Carolina hats Unless when he was in was hot Nepal. Someone might have been. Maybe someone named Dave. It wasn't me. But so we're figuring out this whole thing about like sterile technique in the field. And we had to carry all of our stuff. I'm just going to show you a picture. Oh, I posted this picture. I put it as my profile picture on Facebook. And my sister commented and said, who are you going to call? Uh, when actually I'm doing uh, electro, I'm electro fishing right here. Um, some more pictures. So yeah, everywhere we went, we had to carry all this stuff to our site. And then unpack it and set it all up. And then we had a table, which could be used for all of their filtering. So. Um, they'd pour the water in. These are KU students and then Center for Molecular Dynamics, Nepal folks. We pour the water in to filter it. Then you take the filter paper. Um, you'll put that in an extraction buffer and take it back. And then that will tell you what fish, hypothetically, are in the river. But let me ask you, if you're going to look at the DNA and tell what fish are in that river, what information do you have to have first? I asked that question way too fast. The the fish. Exactly. Now, does this look like an area where we have DNA from all of the fish around? No, so that was kind of our job, was to go and try to catch all these fish and then take fin clips and stuff to get their DNA. So I'm just about out of time. Um, but you know, actually, I'm kind of close to being done here. Imagine that. So, uh, so this is one of our sites. And so these are some of the fish that we collected, these crazy looking pipe fish stuff. Um, this is a CMDN Jeep driving around. This is another site we went to where we got these incredible puffer fish, you guys. The, um, people, we thought they were frogs until they puffed up. And um, so you put these back in the water as quick as you could, because I don't know they're supposed to puff up with air. That's not a good thing. <laughs> um, and then um, some more sites. And so Nico and this woman from USAID came to check and see how everything was going. Some more fish, some more fish. Yeah, so then the students started electrofishing. So they were, they were trained hardcore, which was awesome, because you can't even buy these things in Nepal. So I bought one and took it over to Nepal. It wasn't our electrofisher, don't worry. I bought one and left it over there. <laughs> Caught some more fish, caught some more fish. This is a site that could be completely submerged after the dam. Um, kind of looks like this. Just amazing landscapes. These young, youngsters are catching fish to show to us. These folks are getting ready to fish to show us. This is us having a cup of tea 
in there, all of our volunteers. It was pretty awesome. Youngsters everywhere, man, villagers would come out to check us out. So we'd go out and get rides on boats with them and stuff. This is one site we went to, just look at that. I mean, completely undeveloped land, for better or for worse. It's a tough place to live. And the whole village came out to see what we were doing and explaining to them what we were doing was a challenge. And somebody came and asked me if I was a doctor, and I felt so unqualified to say, yeah, I'm a doctor of fish, but probably what you would like is a medical doctor out here. I'm sorry. Um, so more kinds of fish. And then this one, we finally got up to the high elevation areas. And these roads, they're just scary. There's no other way to put it. Um, we drove around that a few times. It was not a whole lot of fun. Um, I can't really see that very well, so I'll keep going. Um, this was us electrofishing as well. We caught some cool looking fish. Look something like this. They've got suckers on their mouths. They can hang out. Some tadpoles and another catfish. Um, me sporting the UNC Asheville gear. Um, another road literally carved through the rock. Driving along these roads, you just got to be careful. You come to a corner like this, and if there's a car coming the other way, you just hope they're going real slow. Um, I just stopped looking down at one point. I'm just not going to. And then if you do look down and see a truck down there, that's just we really don't want to see that. So those roads kind of winding along there. Um, another picture of, of roads out there. This road scared me to death. We were on this road, and um, somebody said, oh, yeah, last year there were some, there were some trucks working on that road, uh, and then they fell off down in the river, and we still haven't seen them because the river's so deep. I'm just going, just no more stories. Just let us get where we need to go. Luckily, we did. This is our Jeep. Um, we had to actually weld the frame because they cracked the frame going along the roads that we were driving on. Well, when they welded the frame, they cut through the wires that, you, that made all the lights work, so we had to get that fixed. That was suboptimal. We got stuck here, surprise, surprise, in this particular area. Um, we're at a, at a hotel here hanging our nets and everything out to dry, telling, trying to tell what we're doing here. I don't know if you can see the back of our Jeep. It says free Wi-Fi, which is a joke. I kept asking them what the Wi-Fi password was, and there wasn't any. Um, and it says, it says Lord Buddha was born in Nepal. That was a big controversy at the time, because India made a documentary saying that Buddha was born in India. And Nepal and India are like this right now. Uh, it also says, on the back you can't read it, but it says, on the back it says, I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way. Does anybody remember what movie that was from? I think it was Who Framed Roger Rabbit. <laughs> but these, 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 these Jeep drivers are all about like being like, like, bad. Uh, so incredible art on these uh, trucks, although I don't know that I would put the Titanic on the side of my truck. <laughs> Personal preference. Um, not even Leonardo DiCaprio on that one. Um, this was us after another flat tire. We thought it was a good opportunity to come out and take some pictures, so we, we did that. Um, other thing, this wonderful boy who's there selling, selling some berries, really sweet kid, and um, just totally remote area, and it, just really awesome people out there. Also, um, langurs as well which are cool, it's kind of a random picture. Um, ongoing research, but you need to know that. I'm gonna show you some more pictures. The importance of healthy rivers and streams. So I was interviewed on live Nepali TV, actually, because um, people want to know when you're out there catching fish. They're like, what are you doing? This gentleman wanted to know. Tell us what you're doing on this river. So we got to talk to him about that. So thanks to all the folks in the field. This is at the site where we caught 21 species. I'm gonna zoom in. There it is, another Hot Springs, North Carolina hat. Why are there so many Hot Springs, North Carolina hats in Nepal? It's like someone went there and gave a bunch out. I don't know. <laughs> this is Kiran, who actually, he was doing his master's from our research. He just came out to help. Um, and these folks are actually um, work with the university nearby and came out to learn some stuff. More folks to thank, these are KU uh, students. Um, this is when I gave a seminar on the last day that I was at Kathmandu University. I did have a chance to interact with all these professors. And it's really awesome. A lot of people came and had really great questions. Um, it's been really cool. This is at we had to have a seminar at the School of Management because the earthquake had damaged the actual building we were supposed to have it. Lots of folks to thank um, for support, including at UNCA. I can't thank too much um, Irene and everyone making it work with our department when I was not here. Um, the division, you know, Keith and folks at the dean's office, as Claire knows, your mom's over there, which I didn't know earlier, um, <laughs> helping so much to make that, that happen. Um, really, really grateful. Um, family, which, I mean, it was a lot of fun sometimes, but other times it was like, yeah, I'm going out. I'll be gone for a week, and since you've got homeschooling to do, you really can't, like, go there right now. I'm sorry, I'll be back in a week. Um, anyway, that was not fun all the time. Um, another cute photogenic picture. I took this picture, then I realized later that he was pretending to hit Amr Daya with his sledgehammer <laughs> afterwards. And I'm like, well, that's still funny. I'm going to keep that picture in there. So, <laughs> so they were, like, going back and forth the whole time. It was pretty funny. Um, and so this is us kind of hanging out 
this is actually New Year's Day. We were down in the Chitwan National Park all hanging out, having a good time. Um, and so another thought, I saw this in the back of a truck, and I thought we'd end with this. It says, life is short, smile while you have teeth. <laughs> or even if you don't have teeth for that matter, continue to smile, because really what does it matter if you have teeth or not if you smile? So I just think things like that that kind of connect us culturally, right? The, you know, the, the things that make us happy and being able to travel to a different place and interact with folks and have those sorts of conversations and smile is really priceless and shows you that, you know, we are one human family regardless of where we come from and what our, our backgrounds are. So I was really fortunate to have the opportunity to do that and I encourage all of you to apply for things like this because I had no idea if I'd get it or not, but you don't know unless you apply, right, Dave? So the full guys... program is a great opportunity for young scientists. Yeah. You really look into it. Yeah, right, like us. Like yeah, well, right. <laughs> or younger, <laughs> younger. <laughs> so anyway, thanks, and I know I'm, I'm over time now, so there. Thank you all very much. <laughs>